Welcome everyone to the Farm Science Review 2020 online program. Uh, this presentation is part of the Small Farm Tent or the Small Farm Center. Uh, my name is Ryan Slaughter, a research assistant at The Ohio State University South Centers in Piketon, Ohio. We're located about two hours roughly straight south of Columbus. So I'll be giving two presentations today. Uh, the first is on hardy kiwi or kiwi berry production and then later on on hardy fig production here in Ohio. So we'll go ahead and get started. This uh, is a picture shared with me from Will Hastings. He's part of the research team that's collecting germplasm, doing some breeding work, and just general trials for cultivars of hardy kiwi in the, at the University of New Hampshire. He's part of Hale Lab under Iago Hale there. Um, you can see the red blush on the skin of these fruits. It's a couple of varieties have that characteristic as they start to mature, especially uh, if if some sunlight is allowed to uh, penetrate the canopy and kind of touch the skin of the, those fruits, very similar to how grapes start to develop color with uh, permittance of sunlight. So you'll see both terms and uh, we generally try to use the, the term kiwi berry in our talks or our publications, but uh, in most cases if you're going to be doing some internet searches or looking at nurseries to buy plants, you're probably going to see the term hardy kiwi and maybe kiwi berry in parentheses. But as the market starts to develop for these fruits or people become more familiar with them, um, they're trying to they're trying to coin this phrase kiwi berry, anyways. Uh, so. In a growing number of circles, you'll you'll see this term kiwi berry. And most of you, when you think of kiwi, you probably are thinking of the big fuzzy fruit that you can purchase in almost all grocery stores. But that is a little bit different. That is Actinidia deliciosa, and it's tropical. It's not winter hardy for most of the United States. It is, however, grown in places like California where it's a little bit warmer there. Um, the two types that we'll be talking about and the, and the one type that we are studying here at South Centers is Actinidia columicta and then Actinidia arguda. Arguda being the, the type that we are growing. Both are considered winter hardy a range of negative 25 to negative 40. Although, I, I put a note here, early tender growth that comes out in the spring can be damaged by late freeze or frost. We had a issue this year, we had some pretty significant growth starting in March, it was pretty warm here, and then we had a significant freeze in April and all of that stuff was damaged, frozen back and it had to restart, but the plants are looking pretty good now. Um, so they do, they do have some tolerance to it, but that early tender growth is pretty sensitive. Both produce fruit, uh, Arguda and Colomicta, but Colomicta is generally less productive, typically used as an attractive landscape plant that can have some um, nice variegated leaves, sometimes with pink in the leaves, so it's very pretty. In, uh, just to look at. And uh, these plants are dioecious, so they require a male pollinator. And generally the ratio is one to six. So for every six or so female plants, there needs to be a male plant, a pollinator plant within the vicinity of it. Uh, the cultivar trial here at OSU South Centers, we established this planting uh, at the beginning of last year, or uh, in, uh, actually
actually in 2018. You can see the list of plants that we planted here. Uh, it includes nine different varieties of female plants and two varieties of male. Uh, the first of which in the female group is Anasnasnaya, which is a real mouthful, or sh Anna for short. Uh, it's typically what we call it here, just because the, the long name is, you know, kind of a tongue twister. <laughs> And then Chiang Bai Giant, Cordifolia, Geneva, Hardy Red, which supposedly has a, a red skinned fruit, Isai, which is Japanese for one, and it's advertised anyways that this is the quickest maturing plant, or at least to the point where it is established enough to have fruit on it, and it's claimed that uh, it can have fruit in the second year. We have not seen that here. Uh, the plants are, we're really still forming the uh, plant structure for that variety, uh, as, a, as all the varieties are. And Ken's Red, again, another red skinned fruiting variety. MSU, which is, as you guessed it, from Michigan State University. Supposedly it was a variety that they found growing wild in their uh, on their campus. And then the last variety, Prolific, uh, which we've seen of all the groups probably to have the most growth in the two years that we've had them planted. And then the males, 7432, which is just a numbered variety, and it, it's uh, to pollinate Kins Red and Cordifolia. It uh, meets up better as far as flowering for those two varieties. And the male variety, Meter, which is for all other cultivars. And I, I mentioned here at the bottom, Kiwi Berry Organics Company in Danville, Pennsylvania. We've worked really closely to Dave Jackson, the owner of that company, uh, just to, you know, to, to get his, his, uh, his wisdom on growing these plants. He's been in the industry for a few decades and the two varieties that he has narrowed his plantings down to are Anna and Passion Poppers, which Passion Poppers are a variety that he himself has um, created. They've, uh, they do some breeding work there on his farm, and that's a variety that they have bred and, and uh, are growing for commercial production. In Pennsylvania. Yeah, uh, trellising is next. Uh, I really wanted to talk a, a lot about establishment for these crops just because they're relatively new for us um, here in Ohio. So I just wanted to really kind of talk about establishment more than anything. Uh, a, a good strong trellis system is required because these plants once mature are very large. Um, they can be quite heavy just in the plant themselves and then once they have fruit on them it adds a significant amount of weight. So the trail system has, is, has to be pretty extensive, uh, pretty strong. So uh, just here's some a list of things that uh, one might need for a good trail system. A treated or rot resistant post. So we used a treated uh, pine post with uh, cross supports that is also treated, but you can use um, some naturally resistant posts like locust or cedar if you had access to that on your own farm. The spacing, I put a range here, really it's fairly inconsistent, you know, what one might decide to do. We did 20 foot between posts here, but uh, I've seen some as far as 40 feet apart. And it's really kind of dependent on plant spacing. So we did 20 feet with 10 foot plant spacing so that the plants were spaced evenly between posts. Uh, the further the span, the larger the diameter posts required. 
and you definitely need some heavy duty row end bracing which I've got some pictures of it just to show you some examples and wire supports so what I mean by that is basically a, a T a wood T across the top of the post that runs horizontally that holds the wires, the catch wires that hold up the lateral branches for the kiwi plant. And those are a minimum of six feet across. So ours are six feet, but um, Dave Jackson, and you can see in a picture that's coming up, has uh, seven to eight feet T posts or uh, T supports across the top. Just because, uh, you know, with the, the wider the support post at the top or the support brace across the top, the longer that you can train your lateral branches out from the main cordon of the plant, which the branches, the um, lateral branches are where all your fruit is going to be hanging. And support wire, so we use 12 and a half gauge high tensile wire that could be purchased at any local tractor supply store or farm supply store. Uh, there's one cordon support wire that runs right down the center of the system and then two to four equally spaced lateral branch support wires. And again, I have a picture if that's a little bit confusing in the text. And then ratcheting tensioners and hardware, uh, bolts and U-bolts and nuts and things like that. So here's two pictures. Uh, you can see in the text there that the, the picture on the left is here at South Centers in Piketon. And then the picture there on the right is uh, Kiwi's Corners Farm, which is Dave Jackson, that's the name of his farm, his businesses. Kiwi Barrel Organics Company. So you can see here just some slight differences. Our trellis, um, both are obviously T, T trellis, but uh, we used 4x6 posts and then a 2x6 T at the top, all treated. And then Dave, he used um, some 8 to 9 foot tall fence posts, which I see that that says inches now. Oh, yeah, that, that is correct. Eight to nine inch in diameter. So the post itself is probably also eight to nine feet tall uh, with two to three feet inserted into the ground and about six feet or so sticking up out of the ground. And that's the, that's the same case with ours as well. Ours were 10 foot long timbers that we cut down. We put them in the ground about three feet and then just uh, ran a level from one end to the other and cut the posts all to the same height. And our ground's relatively flat too, so that worked out so that some posts were a lot shorter or taller than others. So that worked out pretty nicely. And then across the top there at Kiwi Corners Farm, you see, again, it's just another post, but it's been split in half and then placed across the top of it. The only issue uh, that I saw with this split rail across the top of the trail system there, Kiwi Corners, is that over time, that, that post, that split rail, probably because it was split and it has been put in that position, it tends to bow downwards on the ends just from all the weight of the wire and the plants and the fruit. Now, uh, not to say that that won't happen in the trellis system that we constructed here with the 2 by 6 posts and actually uh, I'm just kind of thinking ahead over the years I would imagine that especially on the ends even though we have these brace wires that go from the very outside of that support brace at the top down to a ground auger and let me see if I can highlight that for you so here we go 
So here at the top, at both ends, uh, this this wire goes up, and on the outside is fastened to the back side of it. So that would help. First of all, it helps hold tension against all these wires, keeps this post straight up and down. Uh, but I think over time, or at least I hope, that it will also keep this board from bending from the weight of all the wires and fruit and everything pulling against it in the opposite direction. So time will tell. This, this system is only two years old. Um, Dave Jackson's system, he's had some of these in for 30 years. So his system's held up quite nicely. Um, so it's just preference or access to certain certain lumber or, or whatever you have on the farm. But uh, definitely needs some bracing. And I've got some pictures of in-post bracing for ours and his as well, just to give you a closer picture. Uh, again, I mentioned the 20-foot post spacing here, that's how it centers, and then the 10-foot plant spacing, and you can see where I highlighted that in the picture. This was in the uh, winter, so obviously there's no plants. You can see that there's no green growth. And this was picture was taken in the late winter before anything started growing. Here at uh, Kiwi Corners, He's got his post spacing 30 feet and plant spacing 15 feet. And we'll talk a little bit about that later, about plant spacing. And if you notice down here, there's a couple of battery operated saw saws. And uh, I'll show you some pictures here in a little bit of why those are going to come in handy here. So again, 12 and a half gauge high tensile wire. And uh, both us and, and Dave use the same wire. It's pretty common for all fruit crop trellises to use a wire like that. And five strands space evenly, starting in the middle. So you can see the arrows and my, my little diagrams or little highlights I've tried to add in there where our wires are, that there's one right in the middle. See this one here, and I've actually got it running through the post and the support brace. <clears throat> that one is your your biggest um, support wire, meaning that the, your plant is trained straight up, the trunk is trained straight up, and then that's the first catch wire that your plant is on. So it um, that's the wire that you train your main cord on across. And then these other brace wires here, they will catch your lateral branches that will always be present from year to year that you'll be rotating in and out through winter pruning and those will have the fruit on them and you'll see some pictures of pruning here coming up so here's a picture of an in-post bracing this is at Dave's farm anybody's built any um, fences for your farm to keep cattle in or whatever, your livestock. This looks pretty common to you with a with a kind of a wire brace down here and a post across it. It's hard to see but in this area um, there's a whole bunch of ratcheting tensioners in that mix of, of uh, vines there. This is actually, these are actually male kiwi plants that are on the row ends that Dave let grow kind of wild uh, and they've just totally enveloped the ends of the rows but um, so they're all attached to this post here and then they those wires come up to the top crossbar which you can see here in this picture the example I talked about earlier how much it's bent downwards because of all that pressure so you can see how significant that is. And then the wires go on from there. And then he does have some 
in post bracing that's very very similar to the way we did it the difference is being he just drove a, a shorter fence post into the ground as his anchor point and we used ground augers those ground augers were 36 inches long and they had a six or eight inch flange on them it needs to be a pretty significant flange just because of all the weight that's going to end up being on these augers they make some augers that have a four inch flange on them I would not recommend a, a four inch flange and then again both well his is a little bit different in the way that all his wires starting here end up becoming the wires that are the ones that run the length of the trellis system ours is a little bit different they come up and end here and uh, then our catch wires are just ran through these little grippers that you stick the wire through and it it's kind of like a little finger trap once you stick the wire through one direction it doesn't come back out the other way and that's also how we tighten the wires down we have a tool that pulls the wire through those little catches and um, that's how we tighten it and in this picture you see that Dave uses those ratcheting tensioners so training and pruning there's uh, where you start is this this vine here and this is where you want it this is what you want it to look like afterwards no this is actually this is um, this is what you want to end with uh, but uh, you can see in the foreground here this is a, a pruned plant but this is a tree that he has let grow in the middle of the vineyard and then there's a, a male plant that he allowed to grow up next to it and this is what has happened this uh, this is a male plant right here um, the issue with this that Dave has seen anyways is that this is a very old vine here and eventually what happens is, is it's such a vigorous grower that as as it grows and puts on new growth every year the new growth tends to tangle or outgrow the old growth or even girdle it in some cases it wraps itself around itself and kills out older parts of it so you've got these great masses of dead plant which could be an issue for disease um, or other problems there and then just new growth kind of growing on the outside of this great big mass of, of plant so um, and actually it's been a while but I believe the plants here in this picture where we end these are males so what what he started as you just let these male plants grow wild thinking that okay they would produce tons of flowers and just pollinate the heck out of put all this pollen out there in the air for the female plants but just saw some issues with what I mentioned before so what he started doing was just treating the male plants like female plants and pruning them in the same way spacing them evenly throughout the vineyard uh, amongst the female plants or in, the, in some cases just having whole rows of male plants uh, spaced intermittently throughout the vineyard so here's a before picture of a female plant that fruited last year and you can see here the main trunk that is growing up to your catch wires and they've stressed the importance of trying to maintain a straight trunk when you're first training those so in your first few years because you can see how thick this trunk is it will actually if you train it correctly and train it try to train it train it straight it will actually support a good deal of the weight of this main cordon up here so very important to keep a good straight trunk in the first couple of years 
<clears throat> so then you have your main cordon across the top that I highlighted, and then all these lateral branches that are coming off here and coming toward the camera, toward me, and then going out the other way. And that's what your other catch wires support are these lateral canes. And these lateral canes will bear the fruit. So the biggest thing is just thinning canes, looking for good straight ones that are coming out naturally. And let's proceed to the next picture. We got a picture. Of, yeah, so here's some after. So you can see here how much was removed. So, uh, gosh, maybe a cane every 12 inches or so they've got coming off here. Uh, and then space evenly all the way down the trunk. So they've removed all that gnarly stuff from around the where it was just kind of all shooting off there. So these these ones this year will have the fruit on them and then they're also going to be sending out new shoots as the year progresses. So here they are, Dave and his assistant uh, doing some winter pruning, cleaning these plants up and they've got these battery operated sawzalls or reciprocating saws. Uh, these are a Black & Decker brand, not that I'm advertising for Black & Decker, but um, Dave said they're the cheapest brand out there and they've done the best. They've worked out really well for them. So they can go out. They used to hand prune everything with hand pruners, of which they still carry around, but they can go out there and really remove some of this gnarly stuff and um, just get some of that gnarly stuff out of there. And just like grapevines, you kind of want to keep your, your good, healthy growth as close to your main cordon as possible. So as far as canes to keep, pencil to sharpie diameter. Sharpie diameter uh, laterals are ideal. And you can see my thumb for comparison. A little bit thinner than my thumb. This one, this picture over here, this cane um, is just a little bit too big. You can see it next to my thumb. Just, uh, and, and again, just like grapevines, this is ideal size, this pencil to Sharpie diameter. Typically in grapevines, and I don't know the answer for kiwis, but typically with grapevines, these are considered bull shoots, just excessively growing shoots that have come out during the growing season. And they, they're they actually, contrary to what you would think, they're, they're more susceptible to winter, winter injury. So they're just not that great of a cane to keep around. Uh, here's just some more pictures of kind of underneath the canopy seeing you know how evenly spaced the canes are and how nice and straight out they are and then you can also see they use some wire ties to fasten those canes to the wire. See how they're kind of loose fitting so you're not going to girdle the canes by having too tight of a wire on there but just kind of keep them in place on that wire so they're going straight out. And again, some some this row here is totally finished pruning, very nicely done. So I have this slide in here just to talk a little bit about. Okay, obviously these vines are very old. Some of these vines, I think, were close to 20, 25 years old. Um, but as far as establishment goes, I mentioned earlier, these vines were 15 feet apart. But as you're going to see here, they, uh, Dave's assistant here is cutting this one off at the base with their reciprocating saw. And then here they are removing that plant. So what they're doing here, and this is Dave's kind of wisdom that he's gained from years and years and years of growing these things. Yeah, maybe for establishment, 15 foot plant spacing, uh, but now he's making them 30 feet apart. And the reason being, and this is this is upon his word, 
these plants are very, very vigorous growers. And unless one is controlling these plants by cultural methods, meaning increased fruit load or decreased light or decreased fertilizers, decreased waters, these plants are just going to grow and grow and grow and grow. And uh, they can quickly become a big mess. So his opinion is the further apart, the better, because then you can control the growth of that plant just by the fact that it has all of this area to support. So, you know, you have your main trunk to keep alive, you have your main cordon to keep alive, and then you have all these lateral canes all along the plant to keep alive. So it's sort of controlling the vigor of the plant by allowing it to be a very large plant versus having these closer together. So then it could just grow, 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 and, and send off all these crazy laterals and create a big mess. And then here they are. So they just took uh, one of the canes that grew last year from the main cordon that was right at the end. It's a nice long straight cane and they kind of turned it around to go parallel with it, the main cordon, and they're fastening it to that cordon support wire. Well, thank you. That is the talk on hardy kiwis or kiwi berries. I'd like to thank you, and I'd also like to thank the Hard Department of Agriculture. This uh, project was part of a specialty crop block grant that we received in 2018 to look at new bramble cultivars, which uh, my supervisor, Gary Gow, gave a talk on that before me. And then these two crops that I'm talking about today, hardy kiwis, hardy figs. I'd like to thank the Farm Science Review for existing, as I've been coming here for a very long time as a kid and as an adult. And I appreciate the um, the offer to be able to talk at it as well. And then I'd like to thank Dave Jackson specifically for this, for all the help that he's given us and allowing us to visit his farm, get some great educational pictures and, and knowledge from him. And then some resources that uh, you folks might be interested in. We have a brand new fact sheet on hardy kiwi production on Ohio Line. So that is the number for it, 1426. You can either click on that link or copy it and uh, it'll take you straight to that fact sheet that we uh, have written and published. And then there's a, a very good publication from the university, or, the, or I'm sorry, Oregon State University on kiwi berry production. And then uh, I mentioned Will Hastings and Iago Hale with University of New Hampshire, the website northeastkiwiberries.com is a part of that and it's also a very good resource. So we'll move straight into hardy fig production. All right. Well, this picture here is a, a ripe fig that was harvested from some plants out of our plots here at OSU South Centers. Um, this is give you an idea of kind of what they look like when they're ripe. Most of them will turn. Most of them start as a as a bright green color and then turn as they start to ripen up, either a purple or brown color. Or kind of hued like this where it's still a little bit green toward the base and then purple at the bottom. Um, this is a relatively small fig. You can see in reference to my hand there in the picture. But it's, it's pretty common size for the figs that we do harvest. Um, there are some figs from the cultivar um, brown turkey that are quite a bit bigger. Uh, but this is a, a relatively average size. Uh, just to talk about the hardy fig trial here at South Centers in Piketon. 
They were planted in 2018. Um, the biggest thing, we weren't really sure about uh, how cold hardy they were, so we had a high tunnel available that uh, had previously had raspberries planted in them and we were done with that trial. So we decided to use that space and do some outside production of these figs versus high tunnel production. The size of the high tunnel was 30 by 40. It's 30 foot wide, 40 foot long. So we had to space plants pretty close together in order to fit in what we wanted to fit in to make it a replicated study. Um, and the spacing that we use is not a spacing that we recommend for commercial production. And um, I'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, we, we planted three cultivars, Hardy Chicago, Brown Turkey, and Olympian. And I have a asterisk next to Olympian just to note that none of those plants survived the first winter after planting. Uh, even inside the tunnel, those plants did not survive. But Hardy Chicago and Brown Turkey both did pretty good. We did have to replant some plants in the second season of those two cultivars, but they had pretty good survivability both inside the tunnel and outside that first winter. And then since then they've done fine. Other cultivars that we're looking at here are listed below. And I'll read through those. Celeste, Fantasia, Hunt, Leticia, Lola Martin, Violet de Bordeaux, and Marseilles. Um, and again, most of those are a dark variety, and I believe it's Marseilles that's a, uh, it's actually a white fig. But we haven't har harvested any fruits from those yet. Um, we're still, we're just looking at those varieties. We, we grew them one season in the greenhouse, and then we'll move the rest of those varieties into field production, into those open spots left by uh, the Olympian plants that we lost. So we'll have more information on those in the future. Uh, just to talk a little bit about site selection, uh, they these fig plants, like, like most other plants, fruit plants that we grow here, like slightly acidic soil, and I'm just talking six to six and a half is ideal for them. Uh, they like well-drained soil uh, and high organic matter, which for us is very untypical. Uh, we have very high clay soils, low organic matter, so they're not very well-drained. Our research plots have field tile, space 30 feet below ground uh, that, that does take some of that excess water out of the soil. And uh, another way that we get around this, we, we build everything, or we plant everything on raised beds. So we have a hilling machine that uh, you work the ground up pretty good with a, a tiller and then go over it with this hilling machine that attaches to the back of the tractor that just simply raises the soil up or forms the soil into a raised bed that's about eight inches tall and that helps kind of shed some of that excess water too just gives it a little extra height just to drain some of that water away that tends to get trapped in our heavy clay soils and then we amended these beds with some organic matter before we planted they do like full sun, um, the more sun the better. Even inside these tunnels where it can get quite hot, they do very well inside the tunnel. Uh, you have to be careful with proximity to drain pipes or sewer lines or underground infrastructure. They have a shallow but very fibrous root system that spreads a lot. So you have to be careful with where you're planting them. So that would be a concern if, one per, if a person were to 
plant them in a landscape close to their house. You'd have to be careful about, you know, your leaching bed for your sewer system. Uh, these plants could grow into it and potentially clog that system up. So you have to have some some thought as to where you where to plant, put these plants. And then at the bottom I put high ground, um, and I just put that as personal experience. Uh, I planted some of these plants at my own personal farm a number of years ago, and um, I put them in a good location as far as soil structure and um, sunlight, but it was in a low spot in our farm. It was close to a creek bed and all the cold air settles in that area in the winter time. So, and I'll mention this again later, the tops aren't necessarily hardy. It's the roots, the root mass that is hardy. So these plants send up new shoots every year. Uh, so it's the really the root mass that is hardy, but if you put it in kind of an uh, extreme location, um, they might not survive or winters. So in my case I had these in a, in a place where cold air settled all winter long and my plants did not make it. None of them did. Um, so some high ground or just to stay away from those those uh, areas in your farm that the cold air settles into. As far as planting goes I mentioned the raised beds already and described that that's a must with most fruit crops nowadays uh, but, but particularly with these figs they don't like um, what, call, what are called wet feet they don't like their roots to be sitting down in, in, uh, in saturated soils all the time uh, landscape fabric is ideal for weed prevention I don't have a picture of that but um, we use the landscape fabric on uh, most of our crops that are that uh, kind of grow in a clump so they don't necessarily spread outside of their clump but uh, so what we do is we build these raised beds and then we cover those with landscape fabric and then come back and mark our plant spacing and then use a just a handheld torch to burn a hole so that we can plant the plants into and this is a really great way to uh, keep weeds between your plants out. Uh, you still will have a little bit of weeds that come up through the hole, but they're so, they're so much easier to take care of when it's not the whole area that you're having to deal with. And then you don't have to spray uh, herbicides if you're concerned about that. You can um, just deal with the weeds with this landscape fabric. And actually in our study, we covered our whole area with landscape fabric, even in between the rows. So um, it's just a great way for weed prevention. And especially if you are thinking about using landscape fabric, irrigation is a must, but even outside of landscape fabric, I would suggest irrigation is a must. Uh, we had some growers who, who had some plants and uh, no irrigation, just natural rainfall was what they were being watered and uh, their plants just never really grew to the full potential. They never really had a good crop of fruit on them. So good consistent irrigation, I think an inch and a half or rain equivalent uh, per week throughout the growing season is, is ideal for these plants and especially in a high tunnel. Uh, irrigation is a must. Spacing uh, like I mentioned before, we spaced our plants very close together just uh, because we had a very tight space to deal with, being the tunnel. Uh, we, we spaced our plants four feet apart in row, and then our rows are six feet apart. But again, that is not recommended. It was just because that's the space that we were working with in the tunnel. Our recommendation for plant spacing and row spacing is five to six feet between plants and eight to 10 feet between rows. And that way you can um, get equipment up and down the rows, mow in between if you decide to put some sod in between your rows. And planting in the spring or early fall, either one. Um, I guess I would maybe lean towards spring planting as long as you have a good irrigation system set up to get those plants watered in well as the season becomes 
uh, warmer in the summer. Uh, my only concern with the early fall planting is that the roots wouldn't get a good established uh, hold before the winter sets in. So that, that would just be my concern with the fall planting. We planted all of our plants in the spring, or uh, the late spring. Too much. Oh, sorry about that. Um, and with that, that would be the, the end of that talk on hardy fig production. Again, I'd like to thank you and the Ohio Department of Agriculture for the Special Weave Crop Block Grant that made this project possible. And again, I'd like to thank the Farm Science Review. I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak here. Uh, resources for hardy fig production. We have a brand new fact sheet titled Growing Hardy Figs in Ohio that you can find on Ohio Line and the number there for that is 1439. If you have any questions, you can reach me at the beginning of my uh, presentation. My email address is listed, or you can visit southcenters.osu.edu and either look me up, Ryan Slaughter, or my supervisor, Dr. Gary Gow, um, who's the lead researcher on these projects. So thank you very much for joining in on my presentation, and have a great day and the rest of the Farm Science Review show.